Leia here from LeiaFirstSci.com and in this video I'll show you the E2 reaction mechanism on cyclohexanes using chair conformations to identify anti and coplanar. You can catch my entire series on substitution and elimination by visiting my website LeiaFirstSci.com slash substitution dash elimination. E2 reactions get a little trickier when you're dealing with a cyclohexane because not only do you have to ensure that you have your four-part checklist, but you also have to make sure that the hydrogen and leaving group are in the anti-coplanar positions. We'll use this example where we have a cyclohexane that has a bromine leaving group next to two tertiary carbons, one of which has a methyl and the other has an ethyl. First, let's verify that the E2 reaction can take place by looking at the four-part checklist used to analyze all substitution and elimination reactions. For detailed videos explaining each of these concepts, visit my website layerforsci.com forward slash substitution dash elimination. First thing we look at is the alkyl chain, specifically the carbon holding the leaving group. Bromine is on a secondary carbon, which doesn't really tell us anything, because on the one hand, a carbocation, meaning E1-SO1 reaction, can take place, and on the other hand, we haven't ruled out SN2 or E2. The next thing we look at is the attacking nucleophile or base to determine if it's strong or weak to give me a two-type or a one-type reaction. NaOME looks a little tricky at first, so let's break it down. When you see Na at the start of a molecule, it's simply a positive spectator to provide a negative to the counter ion OME. ME is methyl, which means our attacking molecule is methoxide, a very strong base and nucleophile. MeO- is too strong to wait for a carbocation to form, so we rule out the one-type reactions, and this leaves me with an SN2 or an E2 reaction. Next, we look at the solvent, MeOH, which is simply methanol. Methanol is polar and protic, which means in a two-type reaction, elimination is going to be favored over substitution because the polar protic solvent tends to cage a nucleophile and slow down that SN2 reaction. Finally, we have a triangle which represents heat. Heat helps stabilize that elimination intermediate, and so E2 is favored one more time over SN2. Last, we check the leaving group and verify that bromine is a good leaving group, and so any type of reaction can take place. Putting all these components together, we know we have a two-type reaction, and since E2 is favored over SN2, this will indeed undergo a beta elimination reaction. With beta elimination, you have to analyze one step further to determine if we have beta hydrogens present, and if there's more than one, which one are we going to eliminate? The carbon holding the leaving group is the alpha carbon, and the carbons directly attached to the alpha are the beta carbons, and this is where we look for hydrogens. The beta carbon with the methyl is tertiary, giving me a tertiary hydrogen. The beta carbon holding the CH2, CH3, or ethyl group is also tertiary, one more time, also giving me a tertiary beta hydrogen. Zaitsev's rule says the more stable pi bond is more likely to form, but in this case, if we eliminate the blue or the green beta hydrogen, we're going to get the same degree of substitution, so which is the product? And be careful here, because the answer is not both. Only one pi bond will form if this undergoes the E2 mechanism, and the easiest way to see this is by placing this molecule onto a chair conformation. When putting a cyclohexane onto a chair conformation, I like to draw the chair first and then add my substituents to save time and save on any confusion. I have my generic chair, I'll put lines for all the axial substituents, and then I'll put the lines for all the equatorial positions. With my chair conformation preset, all I have to do is number the hexagon, number the chair, place the substituents in the appropriate location, and I'm good to go. Here's a trick. I can place the substituents anywhere, but because I know that the reaction has to proceed in an anti-coplanar manner, I want to put the bromine in an axial position. So I'll number this 1, 2, 3, going clockwise from methyl to bromine to ethyl. I want bromine to be in the axial position, and since bromine is on a wedge, it's going up, I'll place a number two on the chair where I have the up substituent in the axial position. Because I numbered the hexagon clockwise, I have to do the same for the chair. So I have one, two, three. I can add in four, five, six, but they're not important. They're just hydrogens. Now let's fill in the rest of the substituents. On carbon number one, I have a methyl on a wedge, which means the methyl is up. 
on my chair, the up happens to be equatorial, and so the methyl is in the equatorial position. I have the blue hydrogen, which should be down, and this one winds up being axial. On carbon number two, I have a bromine on a wedge, which is up. That means I have it in the axial position. I have a hydrogen down, which puts it equatorial. And finally, on carbon number three, I have the ethyl group on dashes, which means it's down. On the chair, down happens to be axial, so I'll add CH2, CH3 down, which means the green hydrogen is up and in the equatorial position. Now this is where you want to pay attention. An E2 reaction can only proceed when the groups are located anti and coplanar. Your professor may refer to it as periplanar. It means the same thing. They have to be lined up in the same plane. On a chair conformation, when two groups are anti, think of that as being trans. Now think back to what you learned in Newman projections. For something to be on the same plane, they would have to be in the axial position because the two axials will perfectly line up with each other. So for example, if we look at the bromine, bromine is axial up. Looking here, we have the ethyl axial down. Recognize that they are trans to each other, making them anti, and they're also in the same plane because they're both axial. And so the takeaway trick from here is the bromine and the leaving group have to be trans and axial. But notice what happened here. Bromine is not trans and axial to a hydrogen on carbon number three. It's actually trans and axial to an ethyl group. The hydrogen on carbon three is in the equatorial position, which means it's not transaxial to bromine and therefore not the hydrogen that I'm going to eliminate. Instead, I have to look over to carbon number two. Bromine is up and hydrogen is down. They're both in the axial position, this tells me the pi bond will form between carbons 1 and 2 because the hydrogen on carbon 1 and the bromine on carbon 2 are trans and axial in relation to each other. Let's look at the mechanism for this and then we'll go back and I'll show you a trick to figure out the product on the hexagon without even drawing that chair conformation. Here is my chair conformation redrawn. The mechanism begins when a lone electron pair on methoxide reaches for that transaxial hydrogen atom. It only takes the nucleus and not the bonding electrons. This causes the bonding electrons to collapse towards carbon-2, towards where that bromine is located. This potentially forms a fifth bond to carbon-2, which can't happen, and so in the process, bromine gets kicked out, taking the bonding electrons with itself to disappear as a leaving group in solution. The product for this reaction shouldn't be drawn in a chair, you should draw it in a hexagon, but let's first show it on this molecule so you can understand what happened. The ethyl group hasn't moved, the methyl group stayed where it is, but it's no longer up or down. Because there's now a pi bond between carbons 1 and 2, the hybridization on carbon 1 is sp2, that means it's trigonal planar or flat, there are no more dashes and wedges. I'm also showing the hydrogen on carbon 2 because the hydrogen again is not up or down, it's sp2 flat. We're ignoring the rest of the hydrogens on the molecule because it's not important to the product. And now let's convert this to the hexagon version of the product. I'm numbering 1, 2, and 3 because that's what we're looking at. On carbon 3 we have an ethyl going down and because it's still sp3 hybridized or three-dimensional we show it with dashes on the hexagon. On carbon 2 we have a hydrogen atom that is sp2 and so we show it as a line. It's not forward or back, it's a line straight out. Same thing for the methyl group on carbon number 1. And finally we have the pi bond between carbons 1 and 2 and this is the correct product. And last but not least, I want to show you the trick for identifying the product when looking at the hexagon, skipping that whole chair conformation step. A word of caution here, when you're first learning this, always draw your chair conformation, but once you're really confident and you don't have time, for example, on your quiz or exam, then you can use this trick. First thing we want to do is identify the alpha and beta carbons. We recognize two beta carbons, so let's fill in the hydrogens. On beta carbon number one, we have a hydrogen going down, so we have dashes. On beta carbon number three, we have a hydrogen coming forward on a wedge. Remember the trick. Anti-coplanar is trans and axial, so we'll start by identifying the leaving group. Bromine is up on carbon number two, so we have to find a beta hydrogen that's down or trans. The hydrogen on carbon number three is also up, making it cis to bromine and therefore not the hydrogen we can eliminate. 
but the hydrogen on carbon number one is down, making it trans to bromine. And as long as we can put this into a transaxial conformation, this is the hydrogen to eliminate, giving me the product. So all I have to do is cross out the hydrogen, cross out the bromine, draw my methyl group on a line because it is now on an sp2 carbon, place the pi bond between carbon 2 and 3, and keep the rest of the molecule as it is. Be sure to join me in the next video where I show you an E2 reaction that does not follow Zaitsev's rule given that we're reacting it with a big bulky base. Are you struggling with organic chemistry? Are you looking for information to guide you through the course and help you succeed? If so, download my ebook, 10 Secrets to Acing Organic Chemistry, using the link below, or visit orgosecrets.com. That's O R G O Secrets. For information regarding online tutoring, visit layofersci.com slash orgotutor. That's O-R-G-O tutor. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and even share it with a friend or two. If you have any questions regarding this video, leave a comment below or contact me through my Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash layofersci. There will be many related videos posted over the course of the semester, so go ahead and click the subscribe button to ensure that you don't miss out.